I mean, there's a ton of things that make pickleball what it is. The first thing I'd say is it is extremely easy to play as a casual player, to be somebody that is not, you know, super invested in playing the sport regularly. And of course, there's a ton of those people too that get obsessed with it and do play it extremely regularly, like every day regularly. But um, you can, you know, not play for months, come back to it and just be like, oh yeah, I, I can pick this up. Like I was just genuinely interested in something. And I feel like whenever you're genuinely interested in something, if you pursue it, you are naturally gonna, you know, find some good things because you're so genuine about it. And Welcome to In Search of Excellence, where we meet entrepreneurs, CEOs, entertainers, athletes, motivational speakers, and trailblazers of excellence with incredible stories from all walks of life. My name is Randall Kaplan. I'm a serial entrepreneur, venture capitalist, and the host of In Search of Excellence, which I started to motivate and inspire us to achieve excellence in all areas of our lives. My guest today is Ben Johns. Ben is considered to be the greatest pickleball player of all time. He has been the number one player in the world in singles, doubles, and mixed doubles for most of the last three years. His dominance includes a 108-match winning streak in singles, over 80 PPA titles, 15 of which were triple crowns, the most of any male pickleball player in the history of the sport, which happens when a player wins singles, men's doubles, and mixed doubles all in the same tournament. And he is also the first pickleball player to win 100 tournaments. On the business side, Ben is a co-founder of Pickleball Getaways, a vacation travel company that arranges pickleball vacations to Mexico, Portugal, Croatia, and other sunny locations. And he is also the co-founder of Pickleball 360, an online instructional video subscription service that gives lessons on how to become a better pickleball player. Ben, welcome to In Search of Excellence. Thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Quite the intro. So you were born and raised in Laytonsville, Maryland, a small town which, as of the 2020 sentence, has a whopping population of 572 people. Your dad, Mark, is a software engineer and owns his own business, and your mom, Heather, is a primary school teacher. You're in the middle of seven children, and there are 23 years separating your youngest and oldest siblings. Can you tell us about the influence your parents had and your siblings had on you, as well as what it was like being homeschooled until you went to college? Uh, yeah, sure. Family was definitely pretty instrumental in pretty much uh, everything I, I've, I've done, really. My mom homeschooled, yeah, all the kids um, up through high school, which uh, obviously homeschooling six kids through high school is, is no easy feat. So I call her a saint. She's incredible. Um, and my dad, as a um, software developer, engineer, designer, after he quit his job when I was like seven or eight, um, he was just doing his own thing, entrepreneur style from there on out, basically. So he was always at home. So basically, we always had two parents around and we were at home a lot. So we were definitely a very tight knit family. And I think they were definitely able to help uh, guide us along, you know, the good paths and uh, support us in whatever the, the kids wanted to do uh, because they were around so much and were pretty, pretty hands-on. So I'd say, you know, they, they were absolutely incredible. And what I always emphasize with them is they never pushed their kids to, to do any, anything in particular. It was more just like, Hey, let's find out what you like, what you enjoy. And if you want to do it, we'll support you in, in whatever you do. Um, so like my older brother played pro tennis, they supported him with that. Uh, my younger sister is a concert pianist. She's in uh, grad school for that now. Um, so really whatever we had a passion for, they were always there for. Um, and mine turned out to be a little bit later in life with pickleball, but uh, they were happy to support the variety of things I did as a kid. I was much more into doing a lot of different things than any one thing very much. Uh, but yeah, you really can't emphasize enough how much they inspired all their kids to to be good at whatever the, it is that they were doing. You know, if you're going to do something, do it well was their philosophy um, and kind of everything they did to enable that. I've always wondered this for kids that are homeschooled. How does the parent or parents or mom and dad know the lesson plan in order to keep up with the other kids at school are learning? And the second part of that question is, it's very hard for someone in high school to be in a classroom of someone in kindergarten, for example. That's why I think we have first grade, second grade, third grade through high school. So how does that work? Are you all in the same room? Is she giving a lesson plan? Where are you getting that from? And how do you know you're keeping even or on track with those in public or private school? Uh, yeah, there were um, definitely a lot of online resources. And I think my mom was really good about picking and choosing between online resources and textbooks and, you know, all, all the resources that are out there, which are really 
quite incredible. There, there's a ton of stuff. And what I really liked about homeschooling is with, in a classroom, you know, you're on a very um, defined track of, you know, the speed of how much you're progressing in any given subject. Uh, and with homeschooling, you don't really have to do that because you're all basically having <laughs> your own personal track. It's because you're not the same age as anybody else around you, you're on your own track. Uh, and therefore you can slow down or speed up on any given thing that, that you're doing. Like for instance, when I was a, a freshman, I had done all the math that you would be required in all of high school. Um, so my mom had me years ahead in, in mathematics. Um, but if any one of us needed to slow down on something or we, we weren't enjoying something as much yet, um, and she wanted to kind of wait for us to develop into it, then she could do that. She had kind of the, the liberty to do that. So she wasn't really pinned down by any um, predefined, like, hey, this is how we do things. It was more just kind of up to her. And yeah, there was not really an official classroom. I think more than almost anything else, I think my, my parents emphasized being independent. And uh, it seemed that, at least to me in hindsight, by the time we were a, a freshman in high school or anything, she didn't really need to be super hands-on with anything. She's like, here's the work you got to do. Get it done on your own time. You don't need to be in the room. You can do it outside if you want. I don't care. Just get it done. Um, I think they emphasized personal responsibility enough to where none of us were shirking that responsibility. We understood it was important and we, we would uh, you know, put it on upon ourselves to actually get it done and get it done well. Um, so I, I really like that part of it. It, it emphasized uh, some personal responsibility to where when you got to college, it was like, oh, I've already done this before. This is the same thing. Um, it, it definitely emphasized independence and uh, just kind of taking care of things yourself and doing them well. When you're homeschooled, how do you keep up in the social aspect where you don't have a lot of friends around? I think one of the great experiences of going to school is meeting people. You make lifelong friends at every step of the way. I still have one friend from kindergarten, a couple from uh, second and third grade, eighth grade, high school, et cetera, uh, et cetera. So were you around kids your own age and how did you interact and how, do, how did you make up for the lack of daily social camaraderie with kids your own age? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely feel like that's something that's often kind of purported about um, homeschooling. And you can certainly do it a number of different ways. And I feel like some probably do miss out on that for, for us personally. One, it helps being in a big family or around, you know, five other, other kids all the time. And uh, I think it's great to be around both older and younger kids, not just kids your own age, because it exemplifies a lot of things that are very productive. Uh, but of course, actual kind of social exposure outside the family. Uh, most of us, at least the, the boys, played a ton of sports. So sports were kind of one of the main outlets and the girls did any number of different things. There's tons of activities you can do outside of, you know, school that exposes you to, to kids. I mean, every day, if you want, it's, it, it can be the same thing if you want that level of social exposure. Um, so, so that was definitely one thing. Mm, and yeah, I'd say I, I never really thought about it that much as a kid. Looking back on it, I was very happy with the amount of, of time we did kind of spend socially just because I felt like we also had much more time to spend on pursuing actual kind of things that we wanted to enjoy, which, you know, some would say as a kid, it's more important, important to enjoy social things than, you know, be great at something. But I'd say you can certainly do both. And I'd lean more towards, you know, pursue something and get really good at it or multiple things if you want. Um, and the social stuff will just kind of happen naturally. Um, and I, I felt like that's kind of what most of us did. Um, and I certainly appreciated the opportunity to to spend more time on the things I wanted to spend on. You were very active a kid. You played a lot of sports. Can you tell us what your hobbies were and go through them and how they prepared you for your future incredible pickleball career? <laughs> yeah, um, I was definitely a, a kid that wanted variety. So I, I played a lot of things. Um, I, I played definitely every sport with a racket. Uh, but growing up, I pretty much did what my, what my older brother did. He was six years older. So whatever he played, I played. Um, he, we were kind of a baseball family initially. So I played baseball from the ages of like six to 16. But I was swinging bats and throwing balls uh, as soon as I could walk, basically. Um, so that was probably the first one. Uh, my brother found tennis when he was 14. So I was seven, almost eight. Um, and I played, you know, as much as he did. And he kind of got obsessed with it. So uh, early on, I was playing a, a ton of tennis as well. Uh, at the same time, we, uh, we like table tennis or ping pong as we like to call it. 
Um, my dad got us a, you know, a table in the basement. So we, we spent a ton of time on that almost equally with tennis. Um, so I'd say those two were the first racket sports we were exposed to. And then more so for myself and less so my brother, I played a, a decent amount of golf as a, as a kid too, which I really enjoyed. Um, so those I'd say were the four kind of primary sports that I really got into. And at various times more one or a couple were more emphasized than others. Each of which requires tremendous hand-eye coordination. If you're going to be good at something. For sure. They were uh, very eye hand oriented, which is all the base guy like eye hand coordination sports a lot. Those those were my So let's get uh, to college. Things. You went to the University of Maryland, Terrapins and College Park. Tell us about how you switch majors and why you switch majors. And from there, let's talk about one class that you took and the huge influence it had and has had on your life. Sure. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I spent my freshman year in the business school, which is kind of purported to be one of the best things about the University of Maryland is their business school. But kind of what I realized a little bit into it is it's not that any of my classes were bad. It's not that I had distaste for anything that I was doing, but I felt like it was definitely emphasized in that school that it wasn't what you know, but who you know. Um, and while I knew that was definitely true to a certain extent, I realized that in school, I wanted to be learning the what's I, like, I wanted to know, you know, more things. Cause I was like, I'm already meeting a ton of great people in pickleball. I can go into business if I want without necessarily learning directly about like a business degree. Uh, not that, I, you know, I, I definitely respect people that get those degrees cause you can do a number of things with them, but I felt like I wanted something a little more concrete and, um, I guess engineering uh, appealed to me in that it was definitely very much about what you know, and uh, you were learning some some hard stuff and some some very intellectually stimulating stuff that I would really struggle with. So I kind of wanted to struggle, I, I guess. And uh, after that first year, I was like, I need something that really pushes me. And um, uh, one class that really impacted me was I remember it was, uh, it was an honor seminar called "How Innovators Think." Uh, my professor was Mark Wellman, and there was a, a, a project in there called the Personal Creativity Reflection, um, which was a number of things. But the gist of it that impacted me was I, for some reason in it, was looking at other, other majors. Um, and I came across an engineering that I didn't even know existed. It was called Material Science and Engineering, which is not a typical engineering that you know you don't you think of like civil or mechanical or whatever. So I had no idea this even existed. And when I saw it, I definitely looked into it a lot more, uh, which was part of that project. And I kind of realized like, hey, this is the one I've been looking for because I had looked at other other engineering even when I was going in as a freshman. I was like, none of these really seem to hit the right spot with me. Um, but seeing that one, which I didn't know was a thing, uh, I, I kind of did realize that that is what I did enjoy. Um, and kind of just from that project and that class, that was what made me um, change majors along with kind of realizing that I wanted something a little more harder and, and finite. Isn't that amazing? We have one class with one professor who can change the trajectory of our career and our life. I had one Don Cor when I took econ as a sophomore in high school which was a new class and it, it just lit me up. I was entrepreneurial already. I had the gene, but part of that class was reading stories about other successful business people and how they created their companies. And I always thought, gosh, this is, this is so great. This is something that I want to do. When you went into college, uh, did you have a goal of, hey, I'm going to go, you're in the business school. I want to go work on Wall Street. I want a marketing job. I think so many students, and I have a, an intern program each summer of 36 amazing students from around the country. It's a teaching internship. It's a 12-week program. And one of the issues that they're most concerned about in the, our program is they have tremendous anxiety about what they're going to do in their life. Some think they want to go into investment banking. We talk about it. I have founders of investment banks, CEOs come in. And after I talk to them about it and these leaders in the field talk about it, around a third of the third don't really want to go into it. And I think around two thirds don't know what they want to do. Did you know what you wanted to do? And what's your advice to all the students out there? And not only a, a student, but a lot of people in the workforce, especially when they're in the first stages of their career, have the same anxiety. What's your advice to them when people really don't know what they want to do? Yeah, you know, that's a great question because I feel like 
numbers don't lie, right? There's a lot of people in that boat that don't really know what they want to do. And I was, I was definitely one of those in business school. Like I liked people. Uh, I liked business. I knew I would like to, to work for myself, um, start my own businesses, all, all that. But I didn't know at least studying wise, what that would translate to, like what I should be studying, what I should start with. I really didn't know where to start, what to do, or what I really wanted to do. I, I knew none of those things. Um, and I'd say, you know, of course, classes certainly help you um, in college. But I would say what helped me was getting a variety of things that didn't really apply to whatever it was I was doing. Like basically, I didn't pin myself down in, in year one to like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm all in on this. Because if I didn't actually know what I wanted to do, I needed to expose myself to more things. Um and of course, the more you expose yourself to, the better of an idea you're going to get. Uh, and that's not just classes. I'd say, you know, expose yourself to hands-on things that uh, impact you in, in some way that you're not used to, right? The more you can expose yourself to things you're not used to, the better it is. And that can be classes, that can be sports, that can be ventures, it can be people. Like, it's, it's just so many things. Um, so meet people, take different classes, do different things, definitely get some hands-on experience in, in many different facets of you know, careers. Uh, I feel like in general, that's something colleges offer, but they don't really push on students is like, Hey, you know, let's do an apprenticeship uh, with this career over here. Uh, go talk to this professor. He's in a unique field. Like you kind of have to take it on yourself in college. Like the, the resources are there, but you have to go find them. Um, so I'd say definitely try to do that as somebody entering college and even for ones outside. I mean, if you don't like what you're doing, I mean, I'd say unless you're, you're doing it for a very good reason, then experiment a little bit. There's, there's certainly resources out there for you to try new things and find something you like, uh, if not love, at least like more than maybe what you do. Um, so the best thing I can tell you is just expose yourself to, to a lot of things. This episode of In Search of Excellence is brought to you by Sandy.com. S-A-N-D-E-E.com. We're a Yelp for beaches and have created the world's most comprehensive beach resource by cataloging more than 100 categories of information for every beach in the world, more than 100,000 beaches in 212 countries. Sandy.com provides beachgoers around the world with detailed, comprehensive, and easy-to-use information to help them plan their perfect beach getaway at home and abroad and to make sure you're never disappointed by a beach visit again plan the perfect beach trip today by visiting sandy.com that's www.sandee.com the link is in our show notes stay sandy my friends so let's go back to your degree and switching your degree to material science one of the reasons there was because you thought about developing an innovating new pickleball racket. So were you clairvoyant at the time when you said, geez, this is going to be a huge sport and I really want to focus on redesigning a paddle that at that point there weren't many out there? <laughs> yeah, um, I'd say I, I have to, <laughs> I'd like to take more credit, but um, there was no clairvoyance. There was no anticipation of how big this sport could be and would be. Of course, I knew it was growing fast, but I don't think anybody saw it being what it is today, um, four or five years ago. Um, what I'd really say is I, I had a genuine interest. That's really what pushed me into that. I, uh, not that I thought that material science engineering is as complex as it is, was really going to apply directly to paddle, man paddle manufacturing, which is not the most complex thing, but I did have a genuine interest in how paddles were made and how we could make them better. Um, it just seemed very fun to me to design something for performance reasons, like a very high performance and a sport is one of the highest performance things you can do, right? Uh, the more you can kind of maximize performance, the better you're going to do in a sport. And that really appealed to me because the design to me was very limited and had a ton of room to, to be a lot better. And it still does. Um, so, so doing that still appeals to me very much. So as much as I'd like to say I, I had a vision of what pickleball could be and that I was investing in the future, I really wasn't. I was just genuinely interested in something. And I feel like whenever you're genuinely interested in something, if you pursue it, you are naturally going to, you know, find some good things because you're so genuine about it. And if you're opening yourself up to, to opportunity, you know, doors are going to open and, and good things are going to happen. Um, so yes, it's great to have a forward thinking, futuristic in, investing type of mind. Um, but I'd also say if you're genuine about something, you can make opportunity for yourself in, in almost any area, really, just by being genuine and having a lot of go get itness, basically. You wrote a blog your freshman year in college. It was a, a web page of sorts. You can still find it online where you said you're very optimistic about your future. 
even though you didn't know what you wanted to do, how important is having optimism in our future success? Um, yeah, I, I think optimism is, is definitely a good thing. Um, and I would caution people against false optimism. Uh, there's, there's a point to where it gets ridiculous. Of course, you have to be a little bit of a realist as well. Um, but it's almost more like, um, I, I like to think of it less as optimism and more confidence in yourself. If, if you know kind of the person you are, uh, the things you're good at, your, your work ethic and, you know, all the things that kind of make you who you are, um, there's always going to be room for you and opportunity for you out there. If you go and get it, if you go and find it. Um, so yes, it's, it's somewhat optimistic, but it's also a little bit more, you know, confidence in yourself have, you know, we, we can all find good things in ourselves that, that we're good at and we can emphasize. Uh, and if you focus on those things, you could call it optimistic instead of kind of looking at the bad things in yourself and the qualities we don't like. Uh, so yeah, I guess to some extent you could call it optimism, but people could definitely probably do a better job of finding the good in themselves and being confident and optimistic about those things. Most people, when they start companies or think about starting our company, fear failing. It's embarrassing. They don't want to be unsuccessful. Uh, it's bad mentally. If they have investors, the investors may not like it. How important is fear of failure in our future success? Yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting because it's almost like two things fighting each other because to me, I'm like, I, I wouldn't be a, afraid of failing that fear is, is never a good thing. But at the same time, you have to have a healthy respect for it because nobody wants to fail. <laughs> you don't fail on purpose. Let's, let's put it that way. Uh, you are trying your utmost to, to make any venture you do not fail. So it almost feels tragic when you do anyway, right? You're like, I gave my all of this and I still failed, right? But in that sense, I wouldn't fear it. I'd say absolutely do your utmost to not fail. That make you know, that's kind of making sure that you gave it your all and that you you didn't leave anything on the table. Um, and then at the same time, when you do eventually fail, you have to kind of just back off and say, what's productive now? Uh, what can I do now to make the most of the situation? And typically, it's learning something from that. Uh, from that experience. And I, I think my parents kind of instilled that in a way I, I didn't realize it until later, but they always had the highest expectations for, for any of us in whatever we pursued. It's like, you are able to, to be excellent at this. Therefore you should be. And we expect it of you. You need to be excellent at what you're doing. And then at the same time, if we ever fell short of that excellence, they'd be like, it's okay. <laughs> It's all right. You don't need to be actually that excellent. We wanted you to to put it in a hundred percent effort to begin with, uh, and know that you did. And then if you still can't, you still did the hard part, which is you know putting a hundred percent in. And now you can learn something from it. Uh, but it's not the end of the world if you don't actually achieve what you want to achieve. It's more important that you gave a hundred percent in order to try to achieve that in the first place. Um, so I liken that to uh, striving not to fail, but at the same time, if you ever do fail still learning a lot from it. He started a company in college called Sick Tricks. Uh, <laughs> TRX, I guess the I is left out of that one. What was that company? And again, you really had a clairvoyant instinct for the future of pickleball. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was uh, definitely more of a, a fun first venture than it was a, uh, a real business. It was me dipping my toe in the water, but it was basically me and a group of friends within pickleball. Uh, that felt like pickleball could be more exciting than it was. Our, our, I think our first tagline was not your grandma's pickleball because it was still definitely uh, the stigma was an old person sport. And we're like, hey, we're young, we're cool. We can make this sport cool. We can make it more fun than it, than it currently is, which is already very fun, but the stigma around it, we wanted to change. Uh, so kind of the idea behind that was was putting on more of a show with pickleball, you know, doing trick shots and, and making it more... Um, spectator worthy, I suppose you could say. So whether that was particular events with the sick trick squad or just a style of how you, you play pickleball and present pickleball to people, it was, it was less of a business. It wasn't really for profit. It was more for, uh, you know, let's, let's try to make pickleball cool. So let's talk about pickleball and we'll start with its history. Pickleball was invented in 1965 on Bainbridge Island, Washington by three friends at the summer home of Joel Pritchard, who has a neat little factoid, served as a Republican congressman from 1973 to 1985, and who, as the story goes, felt compelled to invent a new game to occupy their bored kids. 
Its name comes from a pickle boat, which for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know before I did some research for our show today, is a hastily assembled rowing crew. And the name was a nod to the new paddle sport they were cobbling together from parts of other sports, including badminton, tennis, and even wiffle ball. For our listeners and viewers out there who don't know, and I think everyone at this point has heard about pickleball, but a lot of people don't know exactly what it is and how to play. Can you explain what pickleball is as well as the rules of the game? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's definitely hard to be perfectly succinct with pickleball because it is a combination of other things. Um, but the easiest kind of one sentence thing I have for you, and then I'll get into it a little more, is it's a combination of tennis and ping pong on a badminton size court. Okay, um, so it is technically the same size as a badminton court. Um, I think it's kind of in between tennis and table tennis with it, its attributes. Um, where I can describe it from there, I'd say some of its its kind of sticking points are it's a racket sport that's very easy to learn and very easy to have fun on your first day playing it, which is one of the biggest attractions as opposed to something like tennis, which I think is just mechanically more difficult for people when they're first picking it up. So they're usually not going to have as much fun kind of the, the first day or even the first year that they're playing it. Uh, improvement is definitely very easy. And kind of the, the mechanics of the game are, are such that you can do a lot of different things and still be successful. It doesn't come down to straight athleticism like a lot of sports do. Like, um, obviously, if you're playing basketball with somebody, they can be more skilled. But if you're more athletic, it's, it's going to be tough. Basically, the, the bar between athleticism and skill is much closer in pickleball than it is in sports where athleticism outweighs skill. Um, so that's definitely a big selling point for people. Uh, it's also just physically pretty easy to play you can play it physically at a at a high level and you know exert yourself extremely but you don't have to do that which is why it kind of makes it great for for kids and older people and that's kind of how it, it got its start basically is that it, it was kind of a sport for for everybody but i say it's you know it's not just old people and kids it's everybody and, and really anybody which is another great selling point which is the people you meet in pickleball are from so many varieties of, of life it's like it's the most diverse sport i've ever played in terms of any demographic you want to say it's got age it's got guys and girls it's got people from all over uh it's got them you know in different jobs it, it's really the one unifying thing uh the people playing pickleball don't really have anything in common, but they play pickleball, right? <laughs> so that's why you kind of meet a bunch of interesting, diverse uh, people. It's one of these sports where you really can't explain what it is on a podcast. I think people can go online. There's probably... You got to play it. What's that? <laughs> you got to play you it. You do have to play you it. You play it and then you understand. So, okay, let's talk about professional sports of pickleball i think around three four or five years ago there was a mad dash let's create a league and we're going to be the first ones out there but there were two people out there there are two billionaires who are competing and fighting against each other and there's a lot of confusion today about how many leagues there are what the differences are can you tell us about the two leagues and clear up all this confusion for everybody I'll try to make this succinct as well, but it's definitely a little more complex. But this actually happened much more recently than people think. Uh, the advent of the PPA Tour was in 2020, beginning of 2020. That was their first tour season. What is um, PPA? Of, uh, what does it stand for? Pro Pickleball Association. So they wanted to be the Pro Tour Pickleball, basically. Um, there was also the APP Tour launched at the exact same time, which is a third organization different from from the one you mentioned um and, and i'll get to them later but they were kind of the other pro tour at at that time in 2020 um the billionaires came into it in um in 2021 uh the first major league pickleball event was held in i want to say october of of 2021 so a year and a half really after the the tour had even started um and similarly the the billionaire that acquired the ppa tour also got into it in late 2021 so it was more late 2021 that things really started happening um in the beginning of 2022 the ppa tour along with its new owner um basically started signing the top pro players to to long exclusive contracts uh like three-year contracts with you know stipulations that they play ppa tour events and any events outside the tour uh you know you need permission for and uh, major league pickleball was more of a team style event it wasn't really a tour event it was more like let's put together teams and make this an entertainment spectator based sport rather than just a uh, tour events 
um, in 2022, they they basically talked, tried to work something out, uh, did not, and from there on out, it kind of became pretty adversarial as it was more uh, competitive between the two uh, rather than than working together. And that's been going on ever since then, basically, uh, of warring back and forth. Sometimes they were working together, sometimes they weren't. Uh, and you don't really want to get into the drama and politics of all that. But um, as of today, there there was a a merger at some point to where um, as long as that's uh, signed and done with, then they are basically the same entity now. Uh, so they, they decided that to come together. Um, and I guess kind of on the wayside is the APV tour, which kind of has gone down in terms of uh, how impactful it is in pickleball. They uh, are, are less focused, it seems, on on the pro side of pickleball and more on the uh, providing tournaments for, for amateurs uh, type of thing. They do still have pro events, uh, but l- less so than the other two organizations. Are you looking for your next great gift to surprise a friend, colleague, or loved one? Bliss Beaches makes the perfect gift. This best-selling bright and beautiful coffee table book by Randall Kaplan features stunning drone photography from exotic beach locations around the world. It's the perfect housewarming gift, a great addition to any home or office, and a fun and creative alternative to bringing a bottle of wine to somebody's house for dinner. Bliss Beaches is available for purchase on Amazon, where it has glowing reviews and a five-star rating. Get your next amazing gift and order a copy of Bliss Beaches by clicking the link in our show notes. So just in summary, there's two leagues today. One's the individual league. They've signed players to three-year exclusive contracts, but you have to ask permission to play in different tournaments outside of that league. And the second league, there are teams of pickleball where you sort of like a draft, although I don't think there is a draft where... Yeah, there is a draft, actually. Okay, there is a draft. So so walk us through um, sure. the three-year exclusive. And I'm, when you say that, it reminds me of PJ and Liv, the fight there, because there's antitrust, conser- like there's, there's yes. antitrust concerns when you're signing every pro player to an ex- exclusive deal. Right. Yeah, so the three-year contracts were the initial thing um, that they did in, like, 2021. Um, as of recently, because of a, a merger, they're now working together for a, a schedule together. They're working together on, hey, th- we'll have this amount of team events and this amount of tour events, and the players can choose, you know, this amount of events between the two. Um, so, you know, they're, they're not really exclusive with uh, – without each other they're more synonymous with each other now so they're, they're basically combined at this point uh a team event is just to kind of make it clear what a team event is it's, it's composed of two guys and two girls and normally you know pickleball is played as a doubles team so the you'll play like a guy's doubles match a women's doubles match and two mixed doubles matches as part of your team match essentially um so that, that's kind of what that format is um but yeah definitely happy to say that at this point it's not no longer uh fractured they're they're not uh, both exclusive with with certain players, they've they've come together, and now you were you know back all in the in the same league under the same umbrella, and uh, we'll all play the same events. So, Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, there's no individual people who own those leagues. Do those two gentlemen still own the league where they have where where they make money? Um, and then talk to us about the team aspect. We hear every day that there's a new celebrity. It's LeBron, it's Tom Brady, it's everyone and their mother who are investing in these teams. How much are these teams worth? And how much money are they putting in? Ten grand, twenty five grand, a hundred thousand dollars, five hundred thousand uh, dollars? Yeah. So to answer, to answer that that first part, uh, um, I guess major league pickleball teams. Uh, their current valuation, I think, is around ten million. Um, so it depends on how much percentage of a team you're actually uh, buying. So it can be any, any um, percentage. And you know, a lot of these teams are part of venture capital groups where celebrities are part of those venture capital groups, and then the venture capital groups purchase the team. So depending on how much stake the celebrity has in the venture capital group, it depends. You know, they can basically their money is is spent uh, how that firm deems fit, uh, which could be any percentage for any given amount of money, but that's the current valuation that, that I know of. 
Um, so yeah, that that's uh, that's major league pickleball. Um, it, it definitely got a. I think it got a lot of people talking about pickleball when you know you see celebrity involvement, uh, and I think that's one of the best things about having them involved. Not that they're you know super directly involved, but more people are going to be like, oh, I need I should check out pickleball if LeBron's you know interested in it. And uh, I definitely say kind of the investors in it, both the hands on ones ones and um, the venture capital style. You know, they, they definitely can see the pickleball has very much an appeal as a spectator sport because it's also a player sport. You know, it's, it's very, I mean, it's basically swept the, the nation in terms of people playing it. It went from uh, a very low number to a very high number very, very quickly. And the growth in kind of all aspects of that is, has been pretty huge. Uh, back to your other question about you know, kind of who owns the leagues. Um, not really sure on all this because I don't really pay attention to, to that kind of stuff. I'm more focused on playing, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure the founder of Major League Pickleball has uh, very slight ownership in each of the teams. So kind of the overall league combined, um, but much more majority ownership is in, um, you know, the, the individual teams and how much they own of those teams. And then um, on the PPA tour side, the uh, the majority owner is still the uh, the guy that, that purchased it in 2021, uh, Tom Dundon, and uh, but they have a number of owners as well, so it's it's fairly diffused there. And then with this merger, I'm not exactly sure how everything is split now. I don't know any details on that. How do teams make money? That's a great great question. Um, honestly, right now the the major league pickleball side of things is more of a investment kind of equity future type thing than actually making money. So the tour has always been more focused on kind of making money via events, whether, you know, it's TV, it's sponsors, it's spectators, all those things, you know, there's a revenue model. Um, and then of course you're spending a lot of that revenue on paying players and setting up the events and doing, you know, it's, it's a pretty classic business model. Uh, whereas major league pickleball since the beginning has been more of a vision of what can it be? Uh, rather than a revenue model. They, they don't currently have much of a revenue model. Of course, a lot of businesses are going to be in the red for a while, and their expenses are definitely more in terms of running events and paying players. Um, they're going to be more than what they're making from sponsors and TV, essentially, at this time. Um, but, of course, they're making money from selling equity and new teams, and I think the vision with that is that eventually it becomes more like an NBA, NFL, where there is a ton of value in providing team events, You know, whether it's city-associated and there's spectators coming in and there's huge sponsors. The vision is to make it you know, much like an NBA, NFL type of league, and I think that's why people are buying it, not because you know they're getting revenue today, but because... They think they can get, you know, a ton of revenue in 10 years. When I had a material outcome on a company I co-founded, went public in 1999, everyone's showing you deals. Everyone's got a deal. Everyone's got, you should invest in this bridge where someone takes a toll. You should invest in some palm tree farm, which is actually one that I should have done. And someone said to me, yeah, you should, you should buy a pro soccer team. They were, I think at the time, $20 million, $25 million. Not that I would have invested that kind of money or had that kind of money to invest in the team. But as most uh, teams, when they're bought, they have, it's, it's usually not one person who puts up all the capital. And I thought, geez, number one, I'm not a soccer fan, although I am today. I don't think the league was making money. And I think uh, the teams were losing money where you own a team, but you're having to put in several million dollars a year of cash flow going forward to keep these teams from going bankrupt to make sure that uh, the teams kept going, you have to pay the salary and all kinds of other um, expenses. <clears throat> that obviously uh, wasn't a good decision and it's something I should have done. I think the LAFC, Los Angeles Football Club, is the first MLS team to reach a billion dollar valuation. Are teams going there right now? I mean, $10 million for uh, league that has no major tv contract which is the primary driver the value of these teams seems ridiculous yeah no i would definitely agree with that and i think the reason it gets this kind of you know these types of investors at these types of valuations is kind of the track that pickleball outside of teams has been on and they kind of assume that this sport is on a fast track to get to where other sports is because of what it's done in, in other avenues. Uh, because, you know, a couple of years ago, people had no idea what pickleball even was. And then it went from that to a legitimate pro sport with not major, you know, uh, TV contracts, but certainly, certainly some um, sponsors that are super engaged, wanting to spend, 
um, tons of new players and fans coming in all the time. The numbers of people playing just massively increasing super rapidly, more rapidly than any other sport by far. Um, so all of those things, if you're, if you're looking from an investor standpoint, do you go and look at it and say, is this, is this money worth it now? Probably not. But if it continues on the track that it has in every other facet of the sport, then it certainly will be. Um, and of course, whether that, you know, proves true with kind of this, this whole team thing, um, and getting it like, a, another sport league that, you know, that happens that remains to be seen. Uh, and I think has a lot of steps to, to get there. Um, but I think people kind of believe in pickleball because of what it's done in, in other areas, um, which is, is certainly remarkable for any sport. Um, and I, I would add to that, that I think the number one thing that kind of sponsors and TV want to see are engaged fans and more than just about any sport I've ever seen, uh, pickleball has that they have fanatically engaged fans that are basically willing to do anything about for pickleball. And this was even before. Uh, there was a pro tour. I realized very quickly that people that play pickleball are so fanatical about it that they will do anything for it. Um, and, and that was kind of the, one of the things in the in the culture of pickleball that I think everyone has has really, really liked and stuck with it. So having a fanatically engaged fan base that will do anything for the sport is a, uh, a golden nugget for, for any investor, I think. And as soon as they realize that, they're usually pretty all in. So that's a good segue into some statistics. So uh, I'm going to redo that one, too. Before we get into your incredible career, let's talk about some pickleball statistics. 36.5 million people in the United States have played pickleball at least once in the last year. That's 14% of the U.S. population. In 2021, the average age of a pickleball player was 38.1 years old, which was three years younger than in 2000. The sport is getting younger. The average age continues to decrease, and today, the age group of 18 to 34 represents the largest age bracket of all pickleball players, totaling 28.8% of all players. 60.1% of pickleball players are male, and 39.9% are women. As of today, there are 10,724 known places to play pickleball in the U.S. with 130 new locations being created every month, which compares to 270,000 tennis courts in the United States. California has the most courts and nearly 1,000. Pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the United States. From 2021, it grew an incredible 39.3% in that year alone. And in 2022, it grew 85.7%. Ben, what's going on here and why is it so popular? And are we heading to a situation where at some point soon, over half the U.S. population, over 100 million players, 150 million players are going to be playing pickleball? Uh, yes. I mean, there's a ton of things that make pickleball what it is. Uh, but the first thing I'd say is it is extremely easy to play as a casual player, to be somebody that is not you know super invested in playing the sport regularly and of course there's a ton of those people too that get obsessed with it and do play it extremely regularly like every day type of regularly but um you can you know not play for months come back to it and just be like oh yeah I, I can pick this up again this is a lot of fun um so it's very much a participation sport um and just because it's so easy to to you know have fun and have good points uh the first time you go out and every subsequent time you go out without you know, practicing a lot, uh, which is in contrast to a number of other sports. So there, there's that going for it. Um, I'd say the social aspect is really huge in today's world. There's so many people that I've met that play pickleball and they're like, pickleball is our social seat. This is how we meet people. This is how we make friends. Um, and it's really easy for that. And there's a lot of reasons for that too. There's one, there's the culture. It's just, it's welcoming. When you like pickleball, you want to introduce it to other people. Um, there's that, you know, there's such a variety of backgrounds, you know, because it's kind of the one thing that's unifying people, you meet people that are, are very unique and, you know, you know, you meet people that you wouldn't otherwise meet without pickleball. Um, so I think that's huge. And even the proximity is, is huge in pickleball. If you compare it to like tennis, you're like three times as close to them when you can actually just talk while you play. That's actually huge versus tennis where you basically have to shout at them, right? Just something as physically simple as proximity uh makes pickleball another thing that it is um so it's got a lot of simple things going for it but kind of everything combined has made it this crazy um roller coaster of of growth basically so yeah i would definitely not be surprised to see a a very large percent of america uh playing pickleball on a, on a semi-regular basis um and you know 
we haven't seen many examples of a sport that is so participation based rather than spectator based because you know a ton of people watch football but not that many people play football it's kind of the opposite of what football is so whether that is super successful in different areas of what a sport is like a pro tour or a team league or anything like that that remains to be seen but we do know that as a spectator sport it's incredible so for our viewers and listeners who don't know what Ben is talking about is a pickleball court is 44 by 20 feet, and the game is often played at the net. That's where the strategy is. It's not like tennis where you're wailing away, and you're essentially five feet from the net, and all the players are at the net if you're going to win. That's that's the strategy. And so Typically. the player should envision uh, a much shorter court. They're not yelling at one another. They're talking to one another. They're 10 feet away from each other where, where the game is played. And you mentioned the social part of pickleball. It's 100% right. Everybody talks. It's a great social function. Uh, we have a court at our house, and there are people who continually invite themselves to play. And it's been fun meeting all kinds of nice people, incredible people. It's a great networking aspect, this too. If you've got a court, uh, it's it's phenomenal. I've met so many incredible human beings, business people, philanthropy. I'm very involved in that as well. And it's it's been it it's really added a lot to the social value in our social calendar. Yeah, I would definitely emphasize the uh, meeting some interesting business people and opportunities and entrepreneurs is definitely a, a huge upside as well. Let's talk about your incredible pickleball career and start at the beginning. Can you take us back to your Florida vacation back in 2016 and how things progressed from there? Yeah, so I uh, I found pickleball while I was playing tennis uh, in the community that I lived in, in Estero, Florida. They built pickleball courts near the, the tennis courts that were in the community, and I'd often uh, hit with my brother there because he was training for pro tennis uh, at the time. So um, I'd hit with him at those tennis courts. I basically just saw pickleball played in that community, and um, it looked like fun. I had played a lot of racket sports and paddle sports, and I'm always willing to give them a try. Uh, so I gave that one a try um, and kind of just liked it pretty pretty quickly. And then I just played with kind of the locals in the community, which were admittedly the, the more of the seniors uh, for the next month or so. Um, and then it kind of just turned out that I was in a hot spot of pickleball. Uh, Naples, Florida was going to be the host of the first U.S. Open in 2016. Uh, so that was my first tournament. And around there were a lot of good players. And um, so I met a lot of those good players early on, started playing with them. And uh, really from there on out, it was, uh, it was one-way traffic of pickleball every day. Where were you finding courts back then? Uh, actually, in South Florida, there was pretty plentiful courts compared to everywhere else. Um, there were permanent courts in, uh, in Estero, and uh, the Naples facility had, I don't know, 30 permanent courts. And b besides that, you could find plenty of, of temporary courts. So at that time, South Florida was one, one of the hot spots for pickleball courts, and you could find them pretty easily. But take us through, your first tournament was uh, the U.S. Open. It was 30 minutes from where you were living in Estero, Florida at the time. I believe you placed fifth in that tournament. What happened from there? Did you say, all right, this is something I want to do as a hobby? We'll get into making money later, but there really was no money in the sport at that game. Sure. So yeah. what were you training for? Were you training five hours a day, six hours a day? Or were you just good enough where you just started yeah. kicking everybody's ass all day long? Yeah, well, first of all, I was just playing it because it was a lot of fun. I wasn't training for, for really anything other than being as good as I could, which I guess you could call training, but I just viewed it as playing for, for fun and trying to get better because that's what I liked doing because it was a really fun sport. Um, yeah, I did place fifth in the first U.S. Open, and um, at that time, I mean, that was the pro division, so if I could place fifth after playing the sport for two months, I definitely wasn't taking it seriously as a professional sport. I was like, come on, this is this is kind of easy, right? Uh, but at the same time, I knew how fun it was. So it's not that I was going to say, this sport's a joke, I'm not going to play anymore. It was more like, hey, this sport doesn't have very many players, and you know, I want to play it because it, it's really fun, and I'll continue to play pro tournaments because also that's fun. Um, so I guess in the uh, in the year following uh, that year, 2016, I came back the next year, and I was that year, 2016. I think I played one or two more tournaments. Uh, it wasn't very much because I went back to Maryland, and there wasn't really any pickleball there. So I didn't I didn't play that much for the rest of that year. But when I came back to Florida the following year, 2017, that's when I was a senior in high school. I had a ton of free time. Um, and I, I just played every day, multiple hours a day, um, just because I, I enjoyed it so much. And that year, 2017, I actually won the U.S. Open. So that was kind of the moment where I was like, oh, I guess I am pretty good at this game. So I, um, 
I mean, I was already going to keep playing because it was really fun, but then I was going to, to school in 2017, fall of 2017. It was my freshman year in college in Maryland. Um, and I knew from there that, you know, I was kind of going to do my best to juggle school and uh, travel to tournaments and, and do my best there. I knew I wasn't going to be able to train very much because I didn't have anybody to play with in Maryland, really. Um, and whenever you're not playing as much, obviously, it's going to be harder to get better. But I did know I wanted to travel and, and play tournaments because that's that's what I really like doing. So that was kind of my plan. And that's what I did. I had a, a heck of a, a, a year of pickleball in 2017. And then from there on out, I was juggling school, um, you know, taking tests and exams and then flying on Thursday to go play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, fly back and have class on Monday. Who was supporting you during all this time? How are you making money or getting money to fly to all of these tournaments? <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I mean, we, we were certainly not making good money at, in pro pickleball, but um, kind of the pickleball culture was certainly helpful in that we could almost always stay with friends. Like you just be like, all right, which pickleball player lives in this area? Let me go stay with them. Um, and they were really good about that. They had, I had a ton of wonderful hosts and people in, in pickleball that I still stay in touch with. Um, as far as traveling, kind of airfare and stuff, I got my first sponsor in 2017, Engage uh, Pickleball, which is still in pickleball. Um, so they, they were definitely helpful in kind of covering expenses and giving equipment and stuff. Um, and then, of course, some you know limited prize money, I felt like. The most prize money I probably made in one tournament in 2017 was like $1,500. But I was like, let's go. I'm rich. You know, I can cover three flights with this. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, there, there was that. And, you know, I was coming out ahead, not, not really far ahead, but... Um, by the end of 2017 or 2018, I was like, you know, I can come out a couple thousand dollars ahead playing for the year, counting all my expenses, which is which is great because I get to travel and play pickleball and have fun and I'm not losing money on it. Thanks for listening to part one of my amazing conversation with Ben Johns, the number one pickleball player in the world and the greatest player of all time. Be sure to tune in next week for part two of my awesome conversation with Ben.